So let's not waste any of it. But if I could just get a bit of audience participation. If you work at PMG, could you just raise up your hands really high in the sky right now? Everybody have a look around. So if you need to speak with anybody who works at PMG, these are the folks. They're very nice. Me as well. I do also. And they're happy to answer any questions you might have with that. With that. Okay, put, put your hands down, PMGers. Uh, one more time, if I can. Uh, anybody who attended the last Dallas AI meetup here, please raise your hand. So the last time we had an AI meetup here, just a couple of months ago, if you were there, put your hands up. Uh, not PMGers, not PMGers. <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, for those of you who were there last time, uh, welcome to the link. The PMG office is at the link. This is uh, our shining star at PMG, and we're very glad to have you. So while you're here, please enjoy the food, the beverages, the views at night are epic as well. And if it really strikes you and you like it so much, talk to us later. We can figure out how to get you in this office permanently. All right. <clears throat> With that said, uh, I'm going to pass off to Vlad. He's our director of engineering here, and he's going to speak a little bit about PMG and about what we're here for today. So everybody, this is Vlad. Thank you, Evan. First of all, thank you so, so much for coming to our event. We were worried this is our second meetup we are organizing. We hope to organize them on a regular basis. But this is the second one. This is the first one in the new office. The company hasn't even moved here. We are officially moving here on January 29th. So everything is like starting and we were super worried that maybe not enough people will show up, but actually we have full room. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hopefully it will be interesting to you. Raise your hand if you heard about PMG before this event. Okay. So uh, half of the room doesn't know what we are doing. Um, surprisingly, we are not a, we don't look like a software company. We officially are called a marketing agency. And we are an agency that serves brands like Apple, McDonald's, Nike. We help them run their marketing campaigns. We are one of the most expensive marketing agencies in the industry. We charge more than our competitors. Why? Because we are one of the most efficient marketing agencies in the industry. We offer one of the best returns on advertisement. And that leads me to our secret sauce, which is reality is we are not a marketing agency. We are a software company that pretends to be a marketing agency. Several years back, we started developing a product called Ali. It's a suite of cloud products that automate basically all the workflows that marketing people use in their daily work. And because of the secret sauce, our friends, our marketing colleagues are able to be way more efficient than the marketing people in, a, in, compa in competing, com in the competitors in, in other marketing organizations. We are growing super fast. When I joined the company, and I joined the company about one and a half years back, we had 450 employees. It was September 2022. Now, January 2024, we have 900 employees. We are growing with the speed of Moore's law. And we are going to continue with, with the same speed. We are going to continue growing with the same speed. Which leads us to the main reason why we are doing it. Uh, Sinisha from AWS said to me a few minutes back, I know you are hiring like crazy. And I said, not. We are not hiring like crazy. We are hiring like super crazy. So our main reason, we are looking for the talent. And we are looking for the best of the best, the cream of the cream. Because we are the best of the best. For nine years in a row, we are winning top places in many, many best place to work uh, ratings. Last year, I think we got like 50 of those awards, right? Or something like that. We are talking about massive massive number of awards, but the awards is an indicator of probably we are doing something good when it comes to treating our employees. But of course, we understand we can't get something from the community in this case. We can't get new employees without contributing to the community. So our goal is to help AI community to grow 
to host these events on a regular basis to provide a place for interesting people to talk about their projects, their products, their experiences. I am even okay if, if uh, recruiters from other companies come here. Why not? We want the community to grow because we, we can only grow if the community grows. With that in mind, let's listen to awesome presentations that we have today. Let's eat the food, have the drinks, chat with each other. We are going to have a break. And then after the second presentation, we are going to uh, have pretty, pretty good networking uh, time. Uh, talk to me after the presentations. I'm happy to have conversations. I raise your hand if you actually, if I messaged you on LinkedIn. So there are a few folks. Uh, please, please specifically come and talk to me uh, as well. Uh, we are looking for speakers, as I said. We are looking for different opportunities to collaborate. And the most important, have fun. With that in mind, thank you again for coming. And Evan, the mic is yours. All right. Thank you, Vlad. All right, excellent. Yes, like Vlad said, we'll have a speaker start here in just a minute. We'll have a little break, then we'll have another one. And we'll have another break after that, then we'll close, and then we'll fellowship with each other. All right, so to kick it off, we're going to have uh, a solutions architect from AWS come and speak to us about uh, entertainment with Gen AI, and that is Sai Pudi. Everybody, welcome, Sai. <laughs> Hey everyone, let me get this set up first. Okay, good evening. Okay, a couple of voices. So this is Sai Puri and I'm a solutions architect at AWS and I don't know why this keeps going by itself. I know, right? <laughs> I think. Okay. Give me one second, please. <laughs> I think. Well, setting up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you for our wonderful, amazing hosts at PMG. We will be here even after presentation. We would like to talk to you about anything and everything AI, whether it's generative AI, ML, or just AWS talk. Come find us. We'll be here after presentation. Both Sai and I, we are uh, solutions architects at AWS. That means we are uh, trusted technical advisors. We, we talk to business leaders, technical leaders. We nerd out with our brothers and sisters from administration engineering. Essentially, uh, our job is to help our customers get more experience on AWS, to learn best practices, to adopt new services, and generally succeed with the power of AWS. So we'll be here, we'll mingle. And uh, without further ado, I, I think you're ready. All right, start of today's show. Guys, thank you very much. Thanks, Anisha. So today we are going to learn about generative AI, but not just any generative AI, but what AWS is doing in the space of generative AI in media and entertainment. And we're gonna more specifically focus on content generation and transformation. I'm Saita Japudi. I'm a generative AI TFC member, which is a technical field community, which means I focus on generative AI at AWS. Sinisha was asking me a question before we're coming here and uh, why should they listen to you, right? And a couple of reasons. I'll give you a couple of reasons, right? Been at AWS a little over four years now. Um, before that, um, I used to write microservices um, in Java, um, working for Citibank in the data analytics team. I've seen the revolution from databases, data, data lakes, um, microservices, and then now to generate AI. Over my fa past four years at AWS, I've supported four to five Fortune 500 companies, Cardinal Health, Hyatt Hotels, some in hospitality, some in healthcare, some in 
media and entertainment and i walked multiple customers through their project their mission critical project where they uh, set up whole data lakes um, data warehouses and recently we built a chatbot a virtual assistant using generative ai uh, for one of our customers it's not in production yet so i can't give any more details um, i've written a couple of blogs on aws all in analytics s3 um, and a couple in uh, uh, machine learning sagemaker of course um, and um, recently i've had this generative ai uh, part of this uh, technical field community and uh, i'm uh, presenting here so and sunish already gave his introduction he's a rock star in our team of course <laughs> and a very good friend of lad so let's look at the agenda for today we're going to look about the generative ai on aws an overview a basic understanding of what generative ai is what llms are what everyone in is doing with generative ai what aws is do doing with generative ai what everyone is doing with generative ai on aws and some of the use cases i would like to talk today about is what visual asset transformation and generation anything from images 3d models uh, video everything visual text transformation and generation audio transformation and generation and the fun part question and answers so you will have enough time to ask us grill us with all your questions so hear closely and by any means this is not going to be a deeply technical conversation this is going to be a high level basic understanding of generative ai an order of the possible session of generative ai on aws with that let's first talk about what generative ai is how many of you know what ai is how many of you know what generative ai is okay so now how many of you know what the difference between ai the regular one and the generative ai is the, the hands keep dropping <laughs> so a model is a machine learning model whatever it is but then with the advent of generative ai with huge amounts of data that is available to train these ml models generative ai uses large language models or something called foundational models which are pre-trained on billions of parameters and lots and lots of data we're talking about petabytes and petabytes of data um we couldn't even put into perspective and these are also existing models that have uh, billions of parameters so when thinking about a uh, ai model usually it's uni model right does one kind of uh, uh, modeling if you ask for an a uh, question with a text it can answer you with a text answer but then generative ai models or large language models in general are multi model the same model would be able to help you with text generation media generation uh, video generation and even so sound generation so that's what multi models are and this is based on the main concept called transformers i'm not going to go deeply into what transformers are but transformers um recently are dev uh, dev are de are the re recently developed technology that support uh, multi model foundational models which takes in one kind of output and can give multiple different uh, input and uh, give out multiple different types of outputs and that lets us apply these foundational models to different ranges of contexts and foundational models in general are text to text text to video text to audio etc and why aws there's a lot of big players in ai generative ai um i don't want to name them but i'd want to know if any of you considered aws for generative ai or what's your overall uh, view of the generative ai platforms that are existing anybody vlad <laughs> 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 
So we're not only trying to democratize generative AI by having everyone being able to use generative AI large language models in such an easy way using Bedrock. We are constantly investing on behalf of our customers and building generative AI powered applications. So every service that you see on AWS would someday, I'm not, I'm not promising anything, but would someday have generative AI built into it. So we are investing on behalf of the customers. And generative AI on AWS using Bedrock is the easiest way to build generative AI based mod, uh, applications anywhere. And the flexibility to use all kinds of different applications, different services, different technologies on a single platform um, is why you would use AWS along with the infrastructure that will give you the best price performance. That's a really good question. In a way, we are democratizing and we are uh, rooting for other providers and have all our customers use other providers. We are not insisting on using ours, but I'll get to that and talk more deeply in later slides. But as you can see on the right side of the slide, these are all the generative AI stack on AWS. The first two are Amazon Q, Amazon Code Whisperer, completely managed virtual assistant and code assistant uh, services. And there's Bedrock, which is our generative AI FM service. I'm going to talk about each of this more deeply later. But the <clears throat> bottom layer has the GPUs, the Trainium, the Inferentia, SageMaker, et cetera, which support building of the FMs itself. So in a way, when you see the uh, stack here, it drops down in such a way that it will give you more customization and less management. Now let's talk about Amazon Bedrock. And this is where I answer your question, right? Amazon Bedrock is a way for our customers to use multiple different FMs on AWS. I want to, I'm, I'm using the uh, word democratizing again and again, just because we're not only pushing our, or trying to push our FMs and having other people build on our uh, platform, we are, getting partnering with other services other uh, platforms and bringing them onto our platform to have our customers build with any of the foundational models and have a list of plethora of uh, options for them to build for generative ai applications and with bedrock you also have the capability to customize your fms using your own data something that's really important for enterprise customers when building with their uh, production ready applications is also security and at aws security is our top priority on everything and the same way we have data security and compliance built right into bedrock our bedrock service is also compliant with multiple data governance uh, uh, platforms like gdpr hipaa etc and we're not stopping with just bringing in LLMs and throwing at the customers, hey, go build whatever you want to build with um, uh, these FMs right on AWS. We are still continuously investing. We are developing capabilities for customers to make it easier for them to build generative AI applications every day. And one of those will be agents for Bedrock. And I'm going to talk more about what agents are, but this is one of the capabilities along with guardrails for Bedrock and knowledge bases for Bedrock. Um, I mean, I've already um, given you that. I'm not, this is not going to be very technical. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, we we commit to partnering with whatever the leader in the industry is. So most of our customers use Langchain to build generative applications with Bedrock. So we ourselves use Langchain to build demos for our customers. So. The LLM itself is being offered as a single API through Bedrock, 
But then using Langchain, which is a package in Python, uh, you'd be able to call that API. Yeah, yeah. No, but of course, I want this to be a conversational um, presentation. So, so let's see how a customer can use Bedrock right now. It's as simple as going to the Bedrock console on AWS, choose the FM you want. There's, as, as we mentioned, there's like a plethora of FMs. You customize your data. If you want to find you in your model only, you can use your own data, connect it to the FM, connect the data sources and enable task execution, right? Each of the things that I mentioned earlier, agents, knowledge bases for Bedrock, guardrails for Bedrock, is built into each of the steps mentioned here. So the last step, enable task execution, is done by using agents. The third step, connect data sources, is enabled by using knowledge bases, right? So. I'm going to definitely talk a lot more about what each of those does. So I want to just move on to the next slide now. And these are some of the top FMs, LLMs that are supported by Amazon Bedrock. We have our own models, Amazon Titan, and A1, AI221 Labs, Jurassic 2, Claude 21 2.1. We have recently partnered with Anthropic for that. Llama 2 models, and the most popular stable diffusion model, which helps you in uh, image generation. If any of you are interested in any of these LLMs, meet me after the uh, presentation. I can give you more information on any of the specific things. And as I mentioned earlier, you can definitely customize your FMs. The reason why I used democratizing use of LLMs initially and complete uh, repeating again and again is we're not only having customers use the LLMs as is, use the FMs as is, we are giving the option to customize these FMs using customers' own data. Of course, the FM can do whatever you need without any fine tuning. But the output you need depends on what your requirements are and what data it's based on. So if the output you're seeing from the FM is not as expected, customers want to fine tune them using their own data. And that's when cu customization comes into picture. And right now, models that are available for customization are Amazon Titan, Meta Llama 2, Cohere Command Light. And using customization, customers would be able to manipulate or um, create the kind of output that they're expecting from the FM based on their business requirements. And Amazon Bedrock agents. FMs are only a piece of the puzzle, right? Um, any FM, you go to it, you ask a question, it gives you an answer. But then what's after it? There are thousands of enterprises that wants to do or build generative AI applications, complete generative AI stack based on FMs. But whatever we are doing to democratize the FMs, it's not easier to build overall generative AI applications without the proper knowledge or the tools. And that's where Agents for Bedrock comes into picture. Agents of Bedrock acts as an orchestrator for the things that you want your applications to do. So using Bedrock, now you can build end-to-end -end applications without even writing a piece of code. You create an action group, you would tell what to do with it, and select the FM, select the knowledge base, and you'd be able to do wonders with agents. For example, let's say, a travel company is looking to create a virtual assistant that helps the customer decide where they want to go, where they want to book their next uh, um, trip to, right? With Bedrock or with just an FM, you'd be able to know where you want to go or information about a particular topic. So if a customer asks, 
hey, which location is good if I want to go on a trip in September? It will give you an answer. And FM will give you a perfect answer based on what it, information that it has. But then to go the next step, next mile, and book that trip for them, you would need uh, an end-to-end -end workflow which you can build using agents for bedrock. And that's what that's mentioned here. Agents for Bedrock breaks down the tasks and helps you to orchestrate the tasks. It's let, it lets you to securely access your data. And with everything on AWS, security is the top priority for agents as well. It knows what your customer needs to know or can know. It knows what your customer are not supposed to know. And it uses all the guardrails that are built right into it. And go ahead. These agents are specific to Bedrock, Bedrock and AWS. Langchain agents are definite, definitely different. Um, so yeah, this is only Bedrock. And one important last point, this is also fully managed out of the box. And let's talk about, um, go ahead. Can you say that question again? Lambda is a, a, a serverless service. That's different. Step functions is an orchestrating for that serverless functions. But agent is an orchestrator for the bedrock uh, actions itself. It definitely can. There are ways to do. If even if it's not, even if it's not directly, but there are workarounds to get that done. But I don't really want to go into the specifics of it. But agents can definitely invoke lambdas, invoke whatever the functions are, and any API. If it's an API, agent can invoke it. the foundation model uh, am i getting the rag in this one or, or am i getting a context settings in this one is that the priority because why do i need another integration solution if i have already an integration stack and and your models are accessible through the a, uh, api i can use my existing stack then need any integration stack so let me put it this way right this is the integration that's specific to the bedrock and they generate way applications. This will not work with any other normal application first thing. So any other integration will not replace this. That, that's what I'm asking. What is the difference here? Any other integration does not work here, I understand. But any other integration suite, if I have access to uh, API, mm -hmm. I, can, I can start using that one. For example, like now, uh, any other, take example of MuleSoft. It claims, okay, I have adapter towards the yeah. Gen AI. So I can use that one integrating to other, other systems. Am I getting, for easy, if I want to build a RAG-based application, yeah. am I getting accelerated here? Yes, because this is fully managed. The main, the main focus here is being able to take that heavy lifting off of the customer's hand. Of course, the customer built everything on, on their own just with Bedrock. They don't even use, uh, need to use knowledge bases. They don't even need to use agents. But then there are customers that want to go to the market faster. They don't want to build anything. They just want to go into a console. Does it provide me a vector database in this one to leverage? It provides you an option to select a vector, vector database. Okay, thank you. Everything is inside your VPC. And I'm going to definitely talk more on the security part of Bedrock.
Sinisha is <laughs> as we are running out of time. So. so no nice conversations, guys. Nice questions. So again, bedrock knowledge basis for the same question you, you asked. You don't even need to use this. We don't even need to have this. But then we are investing on behalf of the customer so that they can go to the market faster. You can always create an application, write code on Python, connect, um, have your own API, call your uh, data lake or whatever, right? But then we have an integration that's available already, so you can use it out of the box. Now, companies are building generative AI, virtual assistants, AI assistants, etc. Et but we again have Amazon Q. <laughs> Answer your question again, right? They can do, they can build this on their own. But then we have Amazon Q as a package solution, which helps go to the market faster. I was recently in a executive conference with uh, Payet's uh, CTO, right? And um, uh, we were asking different questions to him. And one of the questions were, what's Hyatt's view on generative AI? Are you trying to ignore it? Or are you trying to get aware of it and uh, strongly pivot? He said strongly pivot. It's going full, uh, full force with generative AI. And one of the reasons he asked me to help with that uh, generative AI application is it takes 30 minutes for uh, his customers to find internal information that's already available in their own data uh, lakes. It's not outside information. It's all the information they have, they contain, but still takes a lot of time, wastes a lot of time of their employees, productive time of their employees to find the information that's already available to them. And that's where a virtual AI assistant, which is fully managed, like Amazon Q comes into picture, right? It's a fully managed virtual assistant, which gives you answers based on your employees' questions, gets all the internal information along with the citations through which you can double check if the model is hallucinating or not. You can upload files, analyze content, and there's a lot of other things, other upgrades coming to Amazon Q. But Amazon Q is the first of its kind, enterprise level, virtual assistant that can help increase our customers' enterprise employee productivity um, without any additional uh, knowledge of generative AI application development. So one of the advantages is fast time to market. This also has an inbuilt vector index with managed ingestion. And it works with SSO. It also is based on a RAG, retrieve augmented generation. And there are some exciting things coming which I can share. Safety and security. Like everything at Amazon, security is top priority with Amazon Q as well. It knows what each employee is supposed to know and what they are not supposed to know. So it follows the guardrails, follows the SSO, and it only shows or gives the information what an employee is allowed to access. So now Amazon SageMaker, as you would all know, is a fully managed ML platform. Even with the advent of generative AI, Bedrock, and a couple of other exciting services, Amazon SageMaker is still growing very strong. The reason for that, when customers want to build their own foundational models, they still need to use uh, Amazon SageMaker. And the main difference between using foundational models through Bedrock and SageMaker Gemstart, which I'm going to talk to in a little bit, is Bedrock is API-based and fully managed. Whereas SageMaker, with SageMaker, you need to know what instance you want to use, what FMs you want to use, and a little bit of integration you need to do yourself from your applications. But SageMaker Gemstart, definitely gives you a lot more options. Of course, we have hundreds of FMs that are available on SageMaker Gemst Gemstart right now for our customers to use. And we have a lot of capabilities for Amazon SageMaker. As I said, it's still growing. 
we are we are still building capabilities for generative ai as well in the bedrock and we are building infrastructure capabilities like hyperpod distributed training libraries and price performance inference is possible using our SageMaker inference components and large model inference components containers. And we are also building MLOps directly into SageMaker. MLOps is being built into SageMaker from so long, but it now also includes generative AI application development as well. And responsible AI and governance, which I'm going to talk to about in a little bit, we are also very much focused on responsible AI using SageMaker and Amazon in general. SageMaker can be used to build FM from scratch? Yes. Or are you saying fine tuning? Why would anyone want to build FM from scratch? And where is the data for that one? I, I can definitely give more information, but we're running out of time. Um, and FM, while being able to answer customers' questions, would not be completely eligible for giving or doing work for all the enterprises, right? Enterprises have their own requirements. The first level of customizing their FMs would be training them using a uh, RAG, RAG approach, using knowledge bases. And then next step would be fine tuning the LLMs using customer's data, right? Um, and it takes a lot more effort, a lot more skill. Uh, I wish I had a board here. There's a, a nice graph I wanted to show. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. It, so the next next step is fine tuning your FMs using customers on data, and that even requires a lot of skill and cost for the customers even to fine tune it. What after that is creating your own FMs. OpenAI did not have their own FM one day. We did not have our own F, uh, FM Amazon Titan one day. We built our own, right? So different FMs act differently. They are pre-trained, of course, on billions of parameters, vast amounts of data, but then completely different. There are FMs being built for industry-specific use cases. Right now, there's a FM for agriculture. There's an FM for healthcare. So that's how, initially, when ML algorithms are coming into existence, they started with simply being, uh, there's an ML algorithm, I can just train it, use it, whatever. Then we started building our own ML models. Companies started deploying hundreds and hundreds of ML models into each page. So that's how we envision the FM industry would go to as well. This will be very, very, very common for companies. This will become very common for companies to build their own FMs. And that's why we're still in, investing in SageMaker. I'm not going to walk into that. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't want to answer that. It's definitely expensive just because there's a managed component to it. But then how much expensive? We need to sit at a table. I'm happy to help you um, after this conversation. Um, we need to have an estimator and everything. So these are all the hundreds of uh, private, both private and public foundational models that are available in Bedrock right, right now. And these are all the partners, anywhere from Databricks, Hugging Face, Cohere, Stability AI. And as you can see, each model, each platform has its own capabilities. No one, no two FMs are same, similar. Even though they say they are similar, if two of them have the both text generation, the way they generate the text, the way they think about going to generate the text will be completely different. Come again? I this is definitely not hundred, <laughs> so I'm just going to make a little more out of this slide. So this is the infrastructure accelerators for generative AI. We're investing in, we're building AWS Inferentia, AWS Trainium, AWS Inferentia two. 70% lower cost per inference, 50% savings on training costs, and also, lastly, 
forty percent better price for performance with Inferentia two. So we are building, of course, our own AI chips. Responsible AI at AWS. I'm going to lightly touch on responsible AI. I know this is a sensitive topic, but we are fully committed. And Amazon has signed the White House pledge on responsible AI. We have model evaluation and guardrails built built right into our services, both into Bedrock and SageMaker. And the main thing I'd want to highlight on this slide would be AWS offers copyright indemnity for outputs when you use Amazon Titan Text Express, Amazon Titan Text Slide, Amazon Titan Embeddings, and Amazon Titan Multi-Model Embeddings, and Amazon Code Whisper Professional. What that means is if you are using to generate whatever you want, the marketing campaign data, what, uh, info marketing campaign information, whatever, using any of these so, uh, services or uh, foundational models, you would have the copyright for that data, not AWS. And I'm not sure what other uh, service, uh, services or platforms are offering this, but we as AWS offer copyright indemnity for these FMs. And these are all the modern applications, media applications that we are going to see examples for today. This is not an exclusive list, but this is some of the applications that we wanted to showcase. The first one is visual asset transformation and generation. This can be as simple as generating new images, right? Stability AI, stable diffusion model is very well known for this. With a simple prompt saying a concept card that flies and can be used as a bot, stable, stability AI, stable diffusion model created this. Before coming to this event, I gave the prompt end of event picture of AWS Dallas A camp meetup event with more than 100 people attending and a presenter from Amazon talking about generative AI in media and entertainment on AWS. This is the output I got. Of course, this is not perfect. Don't look at the faces. We all look way better. But this is what I got in two seconds. And LG also recently built a complete AI artist application based on generative AI. And they used SageMaker to build it. They built the uh, uh, model called Tilda. Uh, the research name is Tilda and the model called Exa1. And they use it right now to design cloths. Eventually, all the designers would some way be supported using this model. We're not going to say AI or generative AI will replace the designer completely, but it's definitely going to support in many ways. Generating new images, character development. Here you can see how generative AI is generating different types of characters with different prompts. The most important thing I'd like to highlight here is prompt engineering and why prompt engineering is important. To have an FM do exactly what you want and what you need, you should be very, very careful on what prompt you are giving to an, uh, an FM. And that's how just changing one or two words changes a lot more on how a character looks here. Raccoon versus cat is very understandable. Those are really different animals, but then once you add a word called futuristic, the foundational model goes back, thinks about it, and then puts into perspective what a futuristic cat is and then gives you a futuristic cat. And increasing the resolution and con uh, of images and also restore content that's old. Being able to use old content that's not usable by a lot of companies, increasing the resolution, make it usable again. And I'm sure many of you have already seen this use case, creating personalized avatars 
but one important thing to note about this is how many more pictures the AI has of you, it will be able to build that better of an avatar of yourself. It keeps learning and keeps improving with every image. That's a neat moonwalk, right? So this is an open source project. The thing I'd like to highlight here is we're not only working with other platforms, we also have the ability to build on open, um, open source technologies. And this is the open source project ControlNet by MIT. I can give you the GitLab link for that. But this is being built using SageMaker using that control net. And here we use frame interpolation. If we already have a video and we want to make it smoother, when we want to make it a slow-mo, see the difference. The difference is quite visible. And this is how generative AI is helping animators or just content creators very well um, uh, create very well defined slow motion content. And we also have the capabilities to just transform the existing video content. You'd be able to select any object out of a particular frame and you'd be able to do whatever you want with that object. As seen here, the image of a dog sitting on a bench is fed into the in-paint anything model. The different parts of it, the segment and in-paint, the segment segments the image into different objects. So now we're selecting the dog as an object so it knows when we say remove anything, it removes the dog, not the bench. And the same way, it gives you teddy bear and also have the dog sit on a swing, which looks dangerous. So now video summarization. We know these days with the advent of Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts, a lot of content creators on YouTube are having to build the short reel videos of their own content. So now with this, with a couple of clicks, they'd be able to create short videos without a lot of hassle. And that's also supported by our AI services, Transcribe and Poly, by giving voiceover for those videos. And this is how Generative AI is helping content creators or filmmakers develop 3D assets. Before the advent of Generative AI, Customers used to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, thousands and hundreds of dollar, dollars just to build this one Dennis pic or uh, image, I believe. But now, Generative AI learns by itself and builds a very, very closer depiction of what they want as a 3D model that, can, that they can use in their games or 3D videos. And now, generative AI for text. This is the most common use case these days. Summarization, reading assistance, writing assistance. It can summarize for you. It can help you write blogs. And while you're too lazy to read the whole article, it can give you excerpts of what each paragraph means in a, in a blog. And generating text for sports. I'll talk more about this use case when I talk about the Fox example, but essentially Fox built an application which it uses to help its broadcasters give out more human-like sentences when someone's trying to copyright what they speak in front of all the audience when someone's watching a sports game. And of course, customer 360 use cases. Enterprises want to know what customers are doing every day, what they're buying, what they're looking at. They even want to know when they're getting up and sleeping if they can. But Customer 360 is one of the most important use cases that enterprises need and Generative AI can 
help with that as well we recently help one of our customers build a personalized ad solution using generative ai so when a customer enters their website looks at a couple of things and they walk out we now would be able to send personalized focused ads for the customers and give out samples of what they can go ahead to buy or book and this again talks more about the media search on the unstructured media media data how you can feed data from knowledge bases into foundational models which would be the rag approach and how all the things that come together to make it easier through such through media which is unstructured by the way i'm going a little faster just because i'm cutting it really close but please feel free to stop or have questions at the end of the presentation and i've seen customers build these conversational analytic queries this is very funny but one month before we came out this we came out with this uh, feature we helped a customer build a conversational analytic solution which they can use to query the databases using normal language so now we'd be able to directly use um amazon bedrock agents and knowledge bases to directly do that and build those applications you don't even need to write any of the code as well and we are also building these integrations and features right into amazon athena and our other analytic solutions so you can directly ask athena hey what are the sales in this uh, area of my company etc and again generating new music content with just a melody a generative ai uh, model would be able to create a fully orchestrated fully uh, composed soundtrack and there are of course different specific models for that and one of it would be stable audio and our service which helps customers do that is deep composer which teaches generative ai in the context of music again generating new music content based on the video and once you give it a small audio excerpt it creates a fully orchestrated soundtrack and these are other use cases that are possible in the, uh, in audio generation and the art of the possible content restoration if an audio clip is damaged you'd be able to recreate it based on what's available right now and you can create scripts based on your audio speech to text so that be able to go through the content really fast and you'd be able to change the voices lip morphing using localization techniques using generative ai so as i mentioned earlier fox built this generative ai application to create narratives using natural language generation every time a, con a, a broadcaster tries to speak in front of the audience of a game they observed it feels robotic in terms of what they say if they say only the uh, whatever the numbers are how the game is going and also not sure if everyone knows or not even broadcasters will have someone copyright for them so that they can speak to automate that piece of their business they used generative ai application to completely automate that and use sage maker and in fact they partnered with our own ml solutions lab to build that and on they found that on average they found 30% lower uh, perplexity while hearing to those new narratives same way lg created that 
designer model using generative AI and Amazon SageMaker that's called XA1. The product is called Tilda. And you can you can grow, go through the numbers. It was trained using 600 billion pieces of artwork and 250 million high resolution images with text. So even though there was an FM that can do a lot more things, they build their own FM just to design and create. So that's where customers are reinventing using AWS and generate AI. Thank you is the last thing I'd like to say. And let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Sai Pudi, everybody. Very interesting chat. We're gonna take a break here. Uh, everybody grab beverage, you know, take a rest stop and come on back in 15 minutes. Uh, what's that? Seven, 17, 717, everybody be back here and we'll be going at that time. Let's wrap up our conversations. We'll find our seats and we can start going here. All right. Excellent. Okay. I don't, what is it? All right. Everybody, clap once if you hear me. Clap twice if you hear me. Shout out to my man right here. Yes, that worked great. Thank you. All right, excellent. Okay, thanks everybody. All right, we're gonna continue with our talks here. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Jared here. Jared Ostermeyer is gonna talk to us about what he's doing with machine learning in disease diagnosis and immune sequencing receptors. Everybody, welcome Jared. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me speak. Let's make sure this works for it first. Okay. So when I was a boy, I uh, read a book about the atomic scientist. And, you know, it's a new technology that had, you know, a, a major impact on society. It had, you know, of course, there was the, the atomic bomb, but it, it wasn't just negative. There's a lot of positive outcomes that came out of it. The other thing that struck me about it was how much of a team effort it was. There was a huge number of people working on it. I think we're facing a new moment in history where AI is you know, the next big thing that's going to reshape society. And I've been blessed to be able to be a part of a team trying to have a positive outcome using this technology. So my name is uh, Jared Ostmeyer, and tonight I'm going to be talking about, yes. I mean, uh... <laughs> we'll see here. Um... It would be great if we could get this working, but uh, I apologize. Technically, this office opens on January 29th. So technically, we don't have an event here. It's a virtual uh, enterprise. Uh, this is the very first event ever organized in this office. So some stuff is kind of not working. We are trying. I mean, we have a few other issues. Definitely, it's going to be better next time. Now, if you want to, we, we, we can take chairs and you can relocate here. Uh, it's, it, th there are many available uh, office chairs in that room. So come closer. No, literally, come closer. It, it's going to be more easy for, for the speaker. It's going to be more interesting for you. And for those of you who are going to come here for future events, you will probably at some point discover that I love moving people around the rooms. He can witness. Oh, oh. 
That's not what I meant. <laughs> oh, that's that's exactly what we did yesterday, right? <laughs> we continue the training. <laughs> okay. I'll have to express my talk through, you know, dance and whatever. I don't know here. We'll give it a few minutes to see if it comes back. While we're waiting, I'll tell you a little, little anecdote. I happen to have a little daughter, and um, I took her to see Grandpa. Grandpa bought this new big pickup truck, and Grandpa said to my daughter, he said, hey, you want to drive this pickup truck? My daughter's looking at this brand new pickup truck. It's, it's, it's amazing looking. And she said to him, you mean it doesn't drive itself? <laughs> and um, I think grandpa was crushed, you know, because he was hoping, you know, to impress her with this new fancy truck. So when I had to get a car, I got a Tesla so I could, you know, have it drive itself. <laughs> that impressed her. <laughs> I think we're giving this another go. You know, I only have so many stories to tell, so many anecdotes, and... <laughs> oh, I just want one, yes, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes before a talk, I, I've started using ChatGPT to come up with jokes. I did not do that before this one. I don't have any jokes off the top of my head uh, for you guys. I think we're close. Um, we may need some assistance here getting the zoom up on the screen um, or linking this laptop to the screen. Ah, yes, hooray, thank you. <laughs> it's a good thing, okay, okay. So. I'm going to be talking tonight about how we can diagnose disease using machine learning, using a new modality for, for basically profiling a patient. So here's the agenda. I'm going to give you a crash course in immunology. We're going to then examine our custom-made TensorFlow model. So I'll walk you through how it works. I'll show you an equation. We'll keep it simple. Um, and then we're going to discuss how we validated this approach and look at some of the results. So why are diagnostic tests important? Well, diagnostic tests are important because when you're sick, uh, you don't know what to do until you have a diagnostic test that's telling the doctor you know, what the disease is, and then that informs the treatment. So diagnostic tests are really central to medicine. Many diagnostic tests are designed to detect the immune response to a disease. So you're sick, you have what we call an adaptive immune response. Uh, your immune system's trying to fight that disease on its own. And then the, the diagnostic test is looking at that adaptive immune response to see if there's a disease signature there. And if anyone wants to move over, don't worry, you know, feel free to move over if you can't see it, because I think we only have the one screen. So. so what are the components of the adaptive immune response? Well, there's really three major components. There's antibodies, which you've probably heard of. There's B cells and there's T cells. We've probably all, all heard of these, but don't really quite maybe know exactly what they are. So antibodies are basically a molecule that's it's a, what we call an immune receptor that's detached from the cell. And then we have these B cells and T cells. Most diagnostic tests only look at antibodies to basically profile those to see if there's a disease signature there. So, you know, we've all probably seen something like this at home. It's, a, it's an antibody or antigen test. And so these are very popular, and you can build them for a variety of different diagnostic tests. They're great at detecting things like a viral infection or a bacterial infection. But maybe they're not so good at detecting autoimmunity or cancers. And that's why we don't have very good diagnostic tests for these yet. But... There's other parts of the immune system here, right? So we can look at the B cells. And those, we, uh, based on our understanding of the biology, could be involved in autoimmunity. We can also look at the T cells, which we know um, participate in cancer responses. And maybe this is a, a way that we can help diagnose cancers. And why do we want to diagnose cancers? Well, if we can catch it earlier, it's very treatable. If you catch it late, it's not very treatable. 
So how do B cells and T cells adapt in response to a disease? Well, whenever you have a, a disease particle invading your body, represented here as this antigen, hopefully you're going to have an immune cell with a receptor that can bind to it. So it's, hopefully you're gonna have that magic immune receptor that has just the right 3D shape and chemical properties that it can bind to that disease particle. And if that's the case, that immune cell will, will begin to proliferate, creating copies of itself and that receptor. So very quickly, the body can generate a large number of these immune cells with receptors that can bind to that disease antigen. So this process only works if you're lucky enough to have that magic immune receptor to begin with. So your body needs to have a large number of different diverse immune receptors to begin with so that no matter what kind of antigen invades your body, you're going to have a receptor that can bind to it. And so how many immune receptors are there in your body? Well, there's about a half trillion immune cells in your body, and each one can express a potentially different receptor. So this begs the question, how do you have so many different receptors in your body? So I'll walk you through this real quick. So right here, we have a developing immune cell. And in that developing immune cell, it has what we call V genes. There are many of them. It has D genes and J genes. So these are encoded in your chromosomes. And the developing immune cell will actually edit its own DNA. This is something that we've learned in the past few decades, that the, these cells will actually edit their own DNA to select a V gene, a D gene, and a J gene, somewhat at random. It's a random process. And bring these together into a functioning immune receptor gene. And basically, there's this region here we call, we call it the CDR3. It's where all the unique aspects of this, this gene are concentrated. So all the, all the diversity here is, is concentrated in this region we call the CDR3. So this is a DNA sequence that's encoded on your chromosome. This gets turned into what we call a protein sequence, which is shown here at the bottom. I probably can't see it, but it's just a bunch of letters. And this protein gets expressed on the surface of that developing immune cell now as an immune receptor to try and bind to a disease particle. And all the unique aspects of the immune receptor are concentrated at the tip. So the CDR3, where all the uniqueness of the receptor is, it's concentrated at the tip of the receptor so that um, it describes what kind of disease particle it's going to bind to. So another developing immune cell will undergo the same process. It'll randomly select a different V, D, and J gene and end up with a completely different receptor for binding a completely different disease particle. So I think of the, this adaptive immune system as like a giant pharmaceutical factory. It's creating these B cells and T cells as a contingency against any possible disease antigen. So here's this new technology. We call it immune receptor sequencing. And it opens the door for a new way to diagnose disease. So we have our patient, we can extract their blood or collect a uh, tissue biopsy. We can sequence that and we'll get back all of these immune receptor genes. And we can um, take those DNA sequences and we can uh, basically do a lookup table and convert it to a protein sequence. So our goal then was to take this data and relate it to the patient's disease states. So we have a patient, we have the, think of the patient as a, as a bag of these immune receptors. And we want to relate this to their disease status. We want to say, okay, given this bag of immune receptors, maybe this person had, you know, HPV, but they never had an E. coli infection. You know, we, we want to get their patient history, but at the molecular level. And there's two challenges to this. The first challenge is, Given the receptor sequence, I don't know what disease antigen it binds to. I just have a sequence. It doesn't tell me what disease particle it's going to bind to. And the second challenge is that only some immune receptors are going to recognize that disease antigen. There's, most of the immune receptors there are bystanders. They're, they're there as a contingency against any possible threat, and they're not participating in the disease response. And we need to have a way to basically focus on just those immune receptors that are responding to the disease. So here's our basic study design. We have patients coming through, and, and by the way, 
I was a professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center. So this is, this is where the research took place. Um, so we had patients coming through, they would be labeled by disease. And so some would have you know, disease, some would not. We would get blood samples or a biopsy from those patients. And from a single biopsy or a single blood sample, there would be millions of immune cells there and we would sequence those. And then our objective was to basically say, okay, what predict that disease diagnosis, predict who had the disease and who didn't. So here's the molecular structure of a T cell receptor bound to an antigen. So I, I spent a lot of time looking at these and I would go through and I would highlight in red the part of the immune receptor that was actually touching the disease antigen. There's about 50 of these structures. So it'd be great if we had them for all trillions of different immune receptors out there, but we only have this, this solved for about 50 structures. And so I just summarized in a table the parts of the, the CDR3 from each immune receptor that were touching that disease antigen. So I just wanted to see if there were any patterns, and indeed a pattern did pop out. What we saw was that there'd be this contiguous strip that would lie in direct contact with that disease antigen. And it was it, it varied quite a bit in how long that strip was or where that strip would be, but it was about four letters long. So what that told us, and it was, a, it was, was not a, you know, it was a reproducible pattern, but it wasn't a strong pattern. But what it told us is that we have these immune receptor sequences from our patients. Then what we need to do is take the immune receptor sequence and cut it up into every little snippet of four symbols. So I have this little sliding window here, four symbols. And the hypothesis was that if a patient has a disease, they should have at least one of these CDR3 sequences that contains a snippet that would be, you know, relevant to the disease antigen. It would be in contact with the disease antigen. And if you're a healthy control patient, then none of the snippets from any of the CDR3s would, would be in contact with the disease antigen. So the next thing we needed to do was transform this snippet into an embedding. So it's basically telling the computer what these symbols mean, right? So, I mean, you look at those symbols, I mean, unless you're, you know, have a background in biology, it's, it's like a foreign language. And so, for example, the letter R and the letter K, they both have, they're both positively charged, but the computer wouldn't know that unless we give it the correct embedding. And so I experimented around with all sorts of embedding techniques, autoencoders, word to vec everything. And actually what I found was the manually made embeddings by the biochemists were actually the best. So they had this thing called Ashley numbers, which are five numbers describing these letters. And it was the embedding that generated the best results. So what we do is we take our snippet here, these, these this four symbols, and we would write out the embedding for each symbol. So the first one is R. And when we come to R again, it's the same numbers because it's the same symbol, so it's just your embedding. And so there's five numbers per symbol, there's four symbols, so it's a total of 20 numbers here. So we would just represent that as F1 through F20. And these are sort of features for our model. So the next thing is we had to score this. So I'm showing you the simplest way of scoring this, but the idea is that um, we take this embedding, Ashley numbers, that's what they're called. And we put it into this scoring equation. So um, then we also, okay, then we, okay, so we put it into this scoring equation and each feature gets multiplied by weight that determines its importance, right? There's also this other feature back here called A, which is the measure of abundance. And this is how many times do we see that immune receptor there? Because remember that, that the immune cell, when it binds to that disease particle, it proliferates to create lots of immune receptors that can respond to the disease. So the measure of abundance is really important. And I'm just gonna skip it for this part of the talk because there's a lot of details that go into that. So we'd use this equation here to basically score every snippet. And the question is, how do you find the bias and the weight values? You need to pick that to get a, the right score. And the computer would be tasked with picking the bias and the weight values. And then the question is, well, how do you do that? With, has, what's the criteria the computer uses to, to fit this? So here I'm showing you biopsies. So on the left, you have disease biopsies. On the right, you have your healthy control biopsies. And here are snippets from actual patients. So from an actual patient, 
we would see you know, about 100,000 snippets. I'm just showing you a handful. And so what we would do is we'd take each snippet, come up with that embedding, put it into this equation, and score it. And every snippet would be scored using the same weights and the same bias. So every snippet scored the same way. And then we'd say, OK, if you're a disease biopsy, we need the constraint is you should have at least one high-scoring snippet. Maybe you have more, but you should have at least one high-scoring snippet. And if you're a healthy control biopsy, you should have no high-scoring snippets anywhere. So that was sort of the constraint that we would use to have the computer find the weights and the bias values for us. And so basically what the computer is trying to do here is pick weights and bias values so that this high-scoring snippets are sort of similar. And there's at least one in all your, your disease biopsies. And in your healthy control biopsies, all the snippets have a low score. So then to diagnose a patient, all you have to do is score all their snippets. And if you see a high score anywhere, you'd say, OK, they have the disease. And if you don't see a high score anywhere, you'd say, OK, they, they don't have the disease. So this is an example of something called multiple instance learning. So it's a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. It's sort of like the, the analogy here. So we went ahead and implemented this in Google's TensorFlow, which is, at the time was brand, brand new. Um, and, you know, now, now I think the field's moved on. So we implemented this. And in, in, like I said, in TensorFlow, we had a stack of GPUs that we'd use to, to run these models. And we'd build these. Specifically, we'd find those weights and those bias values using what we, what's called gradient optimization. So um, I'm just going to sort of jump through to basically what are some lessons we learned because we were building a novel architecture here. We tried lots of things. And what worked best was the architecture that we um, developed that was tailored to this problem. And so we learned some lessons along the way. One is normalize everything. You know, we know that in, in machine learning and data science, you're supposed to normalize your features. Well, when building these, these deep learning models or these AI models, it's really important to use, for example, batch normalization so that each the output of each layer, which is being used as the input into the next layer, is, is being normalized. So between layers, you need to normalize, and that's done with batch normalization. Uh, watch for vanishing and exploding gradients. So we would do that by plotting everything in TensorBoard. Uh, stick to theoretically grounded loss functions. Don't go making up your own loss function. That doesn't, that doesn't help. Um, a lot of times when you build an, a custom architecture, it can become st stuck in what's called a local minimum. And so we would use random restarts to address that issue. So now I'd like to talk about some results. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any model with enough layers, you'll start to see a vanishing or exploding gradient. We used RNNs. We tried that. Okay. Uh, we tried, you know, other approaches. We tried something called a neural decision tree. And okay. that was interesting because it had a vanishing gradient problem, and we couldn't fix it using standard methods, but we were able to sort of, by just plotting out the gradients, understand how to fix it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. No, but, but it, that brings up another question, which I guess is a real question. Do you use any kind of time-changing information? I mean, did, is there a need to use RNNs, or is it? Um, not, not for this case, because okay. not with the data we have. If we had multiple time points from a patient, then maybe okay. you might consider that. Um, but um, not here. OK. We can talk about that okay, more we can talk afterwards. About yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Recurrent neural network. So it's a basically, most data is what you call tabular data. It fits into rows and columns in your spreadsheet. But that, you know, some, not all data fits into that sort of format. A great example would be a sequence. Um, some sequences are longer than others. And recurrent neural networks were really just one of the early uh, attempts in, in, in the field of deep learning at, at, at handling that variable length data. It's a, it's a pretty good method. There's some limitations there. And I think the big reason that they're not used more frequently is that they don't parallelize well on GPUs. Basically, because it's recurrent, you can't run the operations in parallel. One, ha one operation has to run before the next operation can execute. Yeah. The solution you mentioned is 
Uh, can you speak louder? I'm sorry. The the solution you mentioned is a binary. It's a binary classification, and I didn't catch the last part. So we don't know what the antigens are. All we know is the patient's diagnosis. We have their immune receptors. That's the input. We know that there's antigens in between the, you know, there's the disease antigens, but we don't know what they are. All we know is that the patient later got, was given a diagnosis of, let's say, cancer or multiple sclerosis. And then I'll show you some, some results later, but um, uh, typically they were all binary cases. Or if it wasn't, we'd make it binary. So for example, sometimes the doctors would say, grade zero through four, and we'd say, okay, grade two is our cutoff. Yeah, so we would have, each patient would, by the time we got the data, we would get the sample, that could be sequenced. And then later we'd get the patient diagnosis for that sample. And it would be a binary decision. And sorry for that, what wasn't clear. Yeah, yeah. So it's a zero or one decision. Um, let's say in this case, zero means healthy, one means diseased. Yeah, and, and so we ha have to represent that numerically in the computer and yeah. We, yeah, we know what the disease status is. That, that's given to us by the doctors, yeah. We're just trying to predict what they came up with later. So it's, a, it's, so it's a, basically we'd, we'd have the patient samples. In some cases, we'd have the diagnosis already. In some cases, the diagnosis might come a few months later when more information was known about the patients. Exactly, that's the training data. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So a typical study would involve between in the low end 20 samples and the high end several hundred samples. And each one would be labeled, and that would be our training data. Yeah, so I'm going to go back. So for this simple model right here, um, it only has, you know, 21 weights plus a bias term. So there's 22 unknown parameters. We discovered we could fit this model, you know, with about 30 patient samples. Because basically the technical term here is the weights are tied across all the snippets. So because there's a small number of weights, we could, we could cope with the fact that there's a huge number of, of these sequences and only a, a small number of, of labeled labels, which are coming from the patient. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, I joined UT Southwestern because I wanted to focus on, on research related to human health. So I, I never touched any mice at UT Southwestern. Um, I, have, I have done mouse work, but not in Dallas. <laughs> so let's take a look at some results. So already to date, there's already been 25,000 humans who have had their immune receptors sequenced. You know, if you've ever been to UT Southwestern, perhaps you're one of them. But, you know, there's, it's been uh, people, you know, in all various hospitals, whenever they agree to, to, to consent to research, their, their samples may be sequenced. So there's a, a lot of data upon which to build um, better and better models. I want to share with you one of our early attempts here. So uh, this was one of the earliest data sets, which was um, basically there were 14 patients. Uh, each, all of them had colorectal cancer. This is public data. This wasn't one of our studies. But there were 14 patients with colorectal cancer. And from these patients, they collected a tumor biopsy from their colon. And then they went maybe a little farther up in the colon and collected a healthy tissue biopsy from the colon. So from the same patient, they would have 
tumor, and then they would have what we call adjacent healthy tissue. And then they would sequence the immune receptors that were there. So that's what I'm showing you here. So we said, okay, let's, 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 let's fit our model to this data. So what we did is what we called a patient holdout cross-validation. So we would take the first 13 patients, and there was from each patient a tumor sample and this healthy control tissue. So that's two samples per patient. So there's 13 times two, 26 patients. We'd say, okay, let's have the computer find the weights and the bias values based on those 26 patients. And then we're, we're going to take that, that equation once we know the weights and bias values, and we're going to use that to score the snippets from the 14th patient, the holdout patient. And every patient got a turn being the holdout. And this was our way to, see, to determine how well does this approach generalize to new patients, right? Because we're fitting it on 13 patients, we're assessing its performance on the 14th patient. How well does it, does it handle new data coming in? And it, it seemed to do pretty well. It, it, the accuracy was uh, 93, about 93%, so we were pretty happy. But there is a possibility of a model selection bias, because at this point in our research, we were trying hundreds of approaches. We were trying everything, clustering, variational autoencoders, anything we, could, we thought might work, we would try it. And I think that's the real secret to, to how to do this kind of research is um, it's a lot of trial and error, and you just see what works, and you're sort of empirically driven. And, and I, I liked it about that. I like that fact about this research. So in patient three, their healthy tissue biopsy, which is labeled mucosa, was misclassified as being a tumor. And the, the model does, this approach does have a tendency to basically misclassify a patient, so to give you a, a, a false positive. Um, you know, in this case, it's hard to say why that one was misclassified without more information. I mean, I could suspect that maybe that, that healthy tissue wasn't perfectly healthy. That's one explanation. Uh, the model itself is not perfect. That's another explanation. So at this point, we've worked on a variety of diseases. We started off with colorectal cancer. We looked at, next we looked at breast cancer. And it was the same sort of study design where we'd say, okay, you have tumor in one breast, you have healthy tissue in another breast, so it's coming from the same patient. Things got exciting when we got to ovarian cancer because there we had um, patients who, uh, the controls were not patients with cancer. So the controls were basically patients coming to the hospital, uh, but it turned out they didn't have cancer, they had something else. And so it turns out it's really easy to distinguish disease from healthy. It's really easy to say you're sick and not, or, or not sick. It's a lot harder to say um, you have ovarian cancer or you have some other disease. Um, things got even more exciting when we looked at what we call the regression of preneoplastic cervical lesions. So in this situation, um, we kind of flipped the model around. So we basically said, can we predict, so let me back up. So, um, these, these preneoplastic lesions, they're basically precancerous lesions. And some patients are fortunate enough that they have the right T cells there to clear out those precancerous lesions. And so they, they, they get rid of that cancer. And some patients, they progress, meaning that those precancerous lesions become more cancerous. And so um, in this study, we had access to those, those, those precancerous lesions, we sequenced the T cells there, and they were followed up for a year or two to see which ones regressed and which ones progressed. And then that was the labels for our training data. And so that was pretty exciting. It, it, it appeared to work. Although, um, yeah. Um, uh, we looked at CMV status to see, could we detect a viral infection? We looked at multiple sclerosis and autoimmune disease of the nervous system. And then my favorite, we looked at donor T cell compatibility with a cancer patient. So there's procedures like a bone marrow transplant where you actually, um, you're moving immune cells from one person into another and they have to be compatible. And can we predict that compatibility? So we were fortunate enough in some cases to get what we called blindfolded test data. So these were new patients that came through the clinic. I, I was not given the answers to the patient's diagnoses. I had to use my model to try and predict the diagnoses. 
So I was blindfolded to the actual outcomes. And so this was our first real assessment of how well this is working. And we saw degradation in the results. And some of this we can explain, some of it we're still learning from. So for ovarian cancer, the original accuracy was 95%, and that degraded to 80%. So it still works, but not as well as we'd hoped. Um, for this multiple sclerosis down here, we saw a degradation in accuracy. It was at first 86% accurate, and then it dropped down to 72% accurate. And in that case, we think we have a pretty good explanation as to why. We're training these models to mimic the doctor's diagnoses. And Dr. Benjamin Greenberg, a pretty good doctor, would give a diagnosis. And then another doctor for our blindfolded data would look at different patients and their, their diagnostic criteria not, might not be exactly the same. So their definition of multiple sclerosis based on their diagnoses is slightly different. And so we're training the model to mimic one doctor and it's uh, then being tasked to try to predict how another doctor might diagnose patients. So we think that helps explain some of the results. So that's really it. That's the end of my talk. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so we had 32 new samples come in, but the sequencing technology, the sequencing protocol changed um, in the interim. And just looking at the data, we knew right away it wasn't gonna work. Um, uh, basically, on the early data, I'll go back real quick. There's only like a few thousand sequences per sample. You can see the numbers here. So this was an early version of the sequencing. And then um, uh, when we got more data, it was, we we're getting like, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of sequences. And so we just knew right away it wasn't gonna work. And so we knew we'd have to go back and, and, and recalibrate the model and we still haven't figured out how to do that yet. Yeah, we think so for multiple sclerosis, we think so. Thanks. So that is a pretty wide chasm there that is a bit concerning. I mean, so... Oh, well, <laughs> absolutely. Um, that's a problem with multiple sclerosis is it's, it's incredibly hard to diagnose. And a correct diagnosis is sometimes not reached until the disease has been with you for many years and the damage becomes irreversible. So okay. the solution to this problem is to basically um, get the patient labels, get the diagnosis years later. Okay. And then retrain the model where the so, diagnosis is super clear. Now, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I don't have expertise in your field, but it seems to be like this calls for getting multiple doctors to pro pro provide a mm -hmm. diagnosis and use that. That was also tried too, yeah. Um, but I think the best, the, really the, the gold standard would be to just get the diagnoses you know, many years later. And, that, and there are people still at UT Southwestern working on that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, getting enough patients is certainly challenging. Um, we, we built these models, like the, the version of the model I showed you is a relatively simple model. And that was so that we wouldn't quote overfit, right? Because we only had, you know, small numbers of patients coming through. Um, so, we did our best to cope with the small number of, of patients coming through. We're, and in almost every situation I've been in and working in, in sort of cl clinical research, um, you're very rich on features and very poor on labeled data. And you have to be very clever clever with how you cope with that. So so question on this too. I mean, like, you know, COVID's a great example. I mean, clearly it was medical innovation done very quickly. Um, yeah. And clearly data sets large. I mean, that, is that one of the challenges you have if it's not, you know, national data collection versus doc or a hospital and so forth? I mean, I'm kind of I mean yeah. So, for example, COVID, that's one where they actually, many thousands of, of labeled data points exist now. So when you look at these 25,000 human samples, Several thousand of them are COVID. And there's so much data there that you don't have to try very hard to build a good model for it. And so there's already a company that's built a COVID diagnostic based on, on T cells. But then the question is, why would you? You know, like <laughs> you can already do that antibody test and it costs a few bucks. Um, 
but yeah, uh, I think as this technology matures, we're going to see more data become available and that will help ease that problem. I mean, it's, it's the fact of life with this sort of research. I, I mean, I, I think this technology has really been deployed mostly in the U.S. So I, I, someday may, you know, I'm, you know, other countries may, researchers in other countries may start doing it. I, I know other countries are already doing research in this area. I mean, Europe has a lot of research in this area. I know people in China have done this, so. Hello? Hi. Yeah. Uh, hey. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Alex, right? Push, push the button again. I think I canceled your mic. Bumping the button on my mic. There we go. Hi. Okay. Uh, can you mix in photos or videos into the model to <laughs> make, make it a little bit more like, you know, it's like a next iteration? Is that like a possibility? I mean, <laughs> give, give me give me more three D structures of these immune receptors, and I'll mix in some three D imaging no, data of these. No, 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 <laughs> not with that. What I mean, like a per, like you know, with a like when somebody is getting a cancer diagnosis, oh, the doctor mm -hmm. takes you know the, when they're doing a colonoscopy, they'll you'll, you know, they'll take photos of that. Is there a possibility of like mixing in photos of like breast gotcha. tissue? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So augmenting this data with additional data. Um, we experimented around with that. Like for example, um, when one model we started putting in the patient age and age is actually a pretty good predictor of cancer because your risk of cancer exponentially increases as you get older. Um, so we thought, okay, let's put an age into the model. And we learned a lot about how to integrate um, different categories of features together into a single model. Um, so yeah, we, th we threw in patient age. You could imagine throwing in other types of data, other modalities of data like image data. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the lessons we learned about integrating in multiple modalities of data is that, okay, you need to normalize the features, but then you also need to normalize the groups of features, those groupings. So you have immune receptor sequences is one type, you have images as another type. So there's some point in the model where that, where that gets merged together. And I, you know, I learned that through trial and error, you wanna sort of make sure that the, the relative contributions of those different modalities is, is normalized so that they're about equal. So that the model doesn't emphasize one modality over another. Um, that, that was my take on it anyway. Other people may have a different advice or experience. Now, when it comes to incorporating multiple modalities, that's a great question. I've had that conversation with uh, some doctors. Um, one, one thing that comes to mind is when you build a diagnostic test, you want it to rely on one modality so that it's practical. Um, so you don't wanna have to run and do 10 things to the patient in order to test them. So you know, if you can sequence the immune receptors from a blood draw, and that can tell you about something about their cancer status, that would be amazing. Um, but certainly, you know, if it's not good enough, then you have to start looking at maybe augmenting it with more information. Thanks. Um, we Thank had you. another question from this direction. What department are you in that's doing this testing? So um, at the time I was in the Department of Clinical Sciences, uh, I am no longer at UT Southwestern Medical Center. The department's now called the School of Public Health. And with that, I'm going to skip to the end. And I want to give some acknowledgments here. Um, because uh, this was a team effort. It's not me, it's a team. And I really need to thank the wonderful person at the top left, Dr. Lindsay Cal. She was first my mentor. And then when I became a professor, she was my collaborator. And I could not have done uh, any of this without her. But really, it, was, it really took a village to raise me. <laughs> so there's a whole community that was helping me along. And um, while I'm at this slide, I'll just say this. I had this amazing experience at UT Southwestern. I, I came to UT Southwestern because I wanted to become involved in research that would impact people's lives. And one of the doctors uh, took me around to meet his patients. And he wanted me to see um, what they were going through, their ordeal, because he wanted me to understand the importance of the work, the importance of the research. And I'll, I, I think that was such a valuable experience. Um,
Uh, so my question is that, like, I'm trying to combine the two presentations somehow and, like, find somewhat an intersection, is that do you think Gen AI in 3D modeling could somehow be able to create this protein, like, protein structures that could somehow map this immune receptors and somehow cure diseases? Like, how do you see that uh, with, with the current research that you have done uh, with, with the different patients and everything? So, um, you know, there's so many ways to take a, take, uh, there's so many directions research can go. Uh, certainly, for example, maybe you've, we've heard of alpha fold. So there's this problem called the protein folding problem. How do you predict how the, the sequence of, of letters folds up into a protein? And that was a really difficult problem until, uh, alpha fold came along and showed that, you know, doesn't appear to be that difficult. So you can imagine using AlphaFold to get these mo molecular structures of these immune receptors, and that's going to provide you a lot more information about it. So, for example, maybe part of the immune receptor is buried inside and, and can't touch the disease antigen, so you can you know, exclude it from the model. I would not, though, want to even think at that level when building a model. I would want to think about um, letting the model figure this stuff out. So uh, clearly, like more powerful... Uh, modeling, generative modeling AI, uh, is can help here. And I've, I've, um, I've worked. I'm an AI scientist. I, I've, I've applied now active learning to the design of therapeutic antibodies using large language models. So, um, I'll just summarize by saying that in the field of biology, there's so much data. Like your body has a half trillion immune cells. There's no way us as we as a human can, can look at that data. We have to fundamentally have computers looking at this data. And more than that, the computers are going to have to be able to um, think for us in order to make sense of this huge volume of data. So I, I see um, machine learning and, and basically AI, and I'll say strong AI, which may not exist yet, will be fundamental to um, um, progress in medical research and biological research. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Um, but, you know, sometimes the surprises, you know, took an appreciation of, of you know, biochemistry to appreciate. Um, so, some, for example, there, there appeared to be one immune receptor that could, that had two spots on it that could bind the antigen. So it was like this one immune receptor, it was like doubling its chances of binding to that disease particle because it could bind to it in two different ways. So it was like, there's a binding, it's over here it can bind, and then over here it can bind. And that, that, that to me was kind of cool to see. I, I, I couldn't confirm it, but that's what it looked like was happening. Um, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. so so let me back up and say um we tried a whole huge number of embeddings some of them didn't perform well some of them performed just as well but were more complicated and so we would not use them we'd stick to what was simpler but um so they they weren't better but some of them were at least as good. Um, so in this case, using these, the, they're technically amino acid residues, but the, the, these, these, these letters, I think these, this embedding that we use, these Ashley numbers are sufficient. Now, if you're building, I heard someone call it a large medical model, an LMM. <laughs> um, you know, I would want a nice sophisticated embedding or Maybe I wouldn't even think of it as an embedding, but I'd think of it as here's a large language model that, you know, it's some sort of one hot encoding going into the model, this massive art transformer, whatever architecture. Um, yeah. I was curious why you um, had the T cell on your survey and it was a B cell for the um, um, muscular. Sclerosis, I believe, yes. And my second question was, did you do anything on pancreatic cancer? Oh, 
Great question about the pancreatic cancer. Um, there was pancreatic data available. There was no perfect controls for those cases. I went ahead and ran the model and it, it worked, but it wasn't clear if it was predicting pancreatic cancer, if it was basically learning how to differentiate the cases and controls because those controls are not a perfect match. Um, so usually when we're talking about cancer, we'd always focus on T cells because we know that T cells help participate in the natural control of cancer. Um, for other diseases, we might look at B cells, depending on what we thought the biology might suggest that we look at. Does that answer your, yeah. Yes. I think there's limited cases where machine learning AI is entering into the clinic. I have been surprised at how slow it, it's been taking to enter into the into the clinic. So there's you know technologies to perform basically digital pathology to look at a CT scan and try to predict cancer, right? Um, and as far as I know, and I'm not a doctor, right? I'm, or I'm just a PhD. Um, yeah, I haven't really heard of that being used in the clinic. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. It's it's if it if it's a diagnostic test based on sequencing, yeah, that's entering the clinic. If it's a diagnostic test based on imaging, I haven't seen it entering the clinic. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, I mean, so I'm still, um, I guess, technically at UT Southwestern, I'm a, being hired back as a consultant, <laughs> um, at least part time. Um, I, I started a company with a friend called Immunoscope, and we're really focusing on that last, the last row here, which is predicting donor T cell compatibility with a cancer patient. To me, that's the most exciting because it's, it's not just a diagnostic, there's a therapeutic avenue there, you know. What are the T cells that you're missing to help control that cancer? And does someone else have that? Um, but before you can even think about doing a T cell transplant, you have to make sure there's compatibility there, that those T cells, which are quite potent, it can be fatal to, to move T cells around between one person to another, are they compatible? And the current technology is for, for basically determining compatibility is not perfect. It's not sufficient enough to sort of justify that that, that concept of move, transplanting T cells between people. So immunoscope, I think that's the one I'm most excited about. <laughs> it's my baby, um, but it's just a side project. I, I, I applied for federal funding, um, but it's, it's un, the odds are always against winning federal, a federal grant, this kind of stuff, but you, know, you still try anyway. Yes. Um, uh, your PhD, um, did you start out in your studies in more of a medical capacity or? So, um, my history is sort of just kind of random. I mean, I started studying physics and then I, I, I got exposed to biology and I really wanted to merge, you know, computation with biology. And at the time, the only thing that seemed like it would allow me to do that with some this program, this weird program called computational neuroscience. So I did a, a PhD in computational neuroscience. And that really started to expose me to deep learning. Um, and the research I did was very um, abstract. It was very uh, focused on science for the sake of science. And after that, I decided I really wanted to focus on research that was translational, that would be relevant to human health. And I started in multiple sclerosis because it's a disease of the nervous system kind of tying in again to my background in computational neuroscience. And I was really excited to come here because it allowed me to learn immunology. And I knew that was going to be important because the immune system touches every disease, every disease. And then it also uh, coming here allowed me to get involved in human subject research, which 
I wanted to do. Oh, yes. This microphone, oh, it's working. <laughs> I am curious if you ever considered taking your idea here and implementing it in the um, genetic department, um, say, particularly like the uh, ATM mutated cell? Well, I mean, I, I joined the Department of Clinical Sciences. <laughs> um, when you do the sequencing, um, it's, a, it's a, a special type of sequencing. So you have to have a special library, special kit to do this type of sequencing. So if you do like a generic sequencing, on a, you do a whole, what's called whole, gene, whole genome sequencing on a patient, it's not going to give you the immune receptor genes, actually. Um, is that kind of answering, getting it? Yeah. Yes, um, it is. So when you do this, these, this whole genome sequencing, you say, I'm going to sequence your whole genome. I want to see where your cancer mutations are. I want to see if you have a, this gene or that gene. Um, it doesn't capture these immune receptors sequences because the immune cells are actually editing their own DNA to make these, these, this diverse set of immune receptors, right? And they're, they're trying to make as many different types of immune receptors as possible so that they can bind to any possible disease antigen. Disease antigen. Um, but you, you're not capturing those sequences when you do this whole genome sequencing. You have to do this, this special targeted sequencing. See, and while you're doing that, is there a mutation is actually going on while you're doing this process? So you have like a mean grade where you kind of say, oh, this is the, you're kind of like in a shot in the dark. So T cells um, during their development will, will edit their own DNA to make this novel immune receptor. Um, and, then, and then it's one and done. The B cell biology is a bit more complicated and it's sort of a moving target, but uh, it didn't seem to be a problem. Sort of knowing what's happening, there's this thing called hypersomatic mutations, knowing that that's happening would allow us to sort of think about how to deal with it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jared. That was a rousing discussion. Glad everybody had some great questions. The true fact, actually, I don't know if anybody noticed, Jared was, I think, maybe the only person who doesn't work at PMG who raised his hand that he's been to one of these before, and that was actually how we found him and asked him to come speak with us here. So maybe that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, one more time for Jared, please, yes. <laughs> so yes, it is true what Vlad said. If you're interested in speaking up here, get in touch with Vlad, not me, I, I can't really help you, but get in touch with Vlad, he's right there, and we can set that up for sure. All right, before we wrap up here, we're gonna have a few more people come up to speak. One is gonna be Dan here. He's with AI Connects, and he's gonna help kind of get us uh, situated and get a little bit more information on how we can connect with other people in the space. Hi, everybody, uh, Dan Sinawat. Um, I just started an AI community called AI Connects with X, um, and it's really more, uh, I try to bring business people to meet with technology people. Because I was, you know, I have a lot of AI and startup friends, and they all come to me, and I, we will drink, and I drink a lot enough that I think I finally understand AI, and I'm like, okay, now I know how to bring business people to meet technology people. So we are really more oriented toward fun networking, and I just wanted to bridge that world. So look, um, just you know, look us up. Uh, AI connects all one word dot AI and we're going to start having event and we wanted to collaborate more um, with your organization Vlad and everybody here you know because we are about party they are about you know educational and I think there's a good mix there so all right thank you Dan thank you all right and next up we have Marissa she's a PMG -er here she's in our uh, people ops team she's going to talk a little bit about the offerings that we have here and what you could expect if you wanted to enjoy these views for much longer hello oh there we go <laughs> I knew you were also here thank you all for being here um, I know that the intent and the purpose and the hope behind these events is to network 
and connect and to learn from one another. And so it was amazing to see this group grow in size just month over month. Um, so, so excited to see everyone here. I would be, I know there are many different reasons why you may be here connecting and networking. One of them may be that you're on the job hunt. If so, I just wanted to open up that we have nine roles here at PMG in the um, data analysts and software engineering and development roles on our AI and software engineering teams. I'm a campus recruiter, so I'll be fully transparent. I focus on early careers. If you're more experienced in your career, I can connect you with Janie, who wasn't able to be here tonight. It's her birthday. Um, and um, would be happy to speak with you about what those opportunities look like as well, okay? Thank you again. Thank you. All right. And then last, we're going to welcome Vlad back up to wrap us up, and uh, then we'll conclude after that. Vlad, please. Should we do the next one? Who says yes? We will. The next one is going to be on the last week of March. The exact date is, Emily, what is the exact date? The 28th, maybe. So please mark the 28th, maybe, in your calendar. The idea is to do these events, maybe like six or seven more this year, and then by the end of the year to see how it's working. And if the community is really growing, we will probably continue next year. But definitely we are going to be trying this, this year to keep moving and keep developing this community. As I mentioned at the very beginning, our main goal is hiring, and we are not going to hire like crazy. We are going to hire like super crazy. So we are going to do go through a few exercises here. First, let's call, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Tanisha, did you do it? Did you close? Cool. Close your eyes. I think of at least one person who you think would be either a good software engineer, a good software man engineering manager, or a good software engineering and AI director for PMG. And please remember the name of that person. Don't open your eyes yet. Now think about at least one person. And by the way, you can be that person, right? Don't don't open, don't open your eyes, close your eyes. Now think about a person, and it, again, it could be you, who could be a good speaker for the next event here. So until you have two names in mind, one good candidate to join our engineering team and one good candidate to speak here, don't open your eyes. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now, I assume you want to actually see the world around you, so yeah, you probably have two of those names, so please do open your eyes now and take out your cell phones. No, literally, like, take right now, show me your cell phones. Do you have those? Oh, you do, wonderful. So please take a picture or a couple of pictures. Just capture what you see. Just, no, no, seriously, just take a picture. You, you will, the security is not going to allow you to leave this building until you take a picture. That's the, there are all those cameras, they're looking at you. <laughs> now, please go to your LinkedIn and post this picture and tag those two names. And write just one sentence about the event which is happening right now. Let's spend a minute on that. Write a short, very short message about what is happening here right now. Post this picture and tag those two names. And again, the security is not going to let you out until you do that. Now, that's only the first exercise. I have more, so please finish this one. Let's spend like a, guys, I assume you are doing it. Guys, I assume you have already finished doing that and because of that you are talking, right? 
Show me your phone. Show me your picture. Show me what you posted. <laughs> you are not allowed to come here without a fully charged battery. It's illegal. It's the rule, Emily. Let's make it a rule. Let's make sure that we check every... Hello. Let's make sure we check every person who goes here for the next meetup. And if they don't have fully charged battery, we are not allowing them to go here. Now, seriously. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming here. We really, really appreciate you spending your time with us. We really hope that there was value and there will be value. There will be networking. There, there is still food there. And of course there is wine and beer and all those drinks. And of course there is a Jerry and uh, Sinisha who are chatting there. Uh, uh, they're awesome people to chat with. So make sure once we finish this like presentation part, make sure you chat with those two guys. They're awesome. Trust me, I, I am an expert in awesomeness. I know who awesome are. They are awesome. Uh, but really, thank you so much. Let's also thank those people who made this event happen, which is Emily and the entire crew from PMG. Guys, thank you. Thank you so much. This is huge work, especially given the fact that this open hasn't opened yet. This office hasn't opened yet, right? Now, I promise you the next exercise, right? Please look at the opposite side of the room. No, no, no. I mean, if you sit here, look there. If you sit there, look here. <laughs> look at the face which looks completely strange and unfamiliar to you. Just focus on that face. And once I finish now, go to that person. Introduce yourself. Tell them what you do. Ask them what they do. Learn about them. Let's network. Let's meet each other. Let's build the community. Let's grow together. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.